All right, YouTube. We uh, we took a little hiatus after week 16, calmed down. We, uh, or at least I fell off the face of the earth. You know, I was enjoying the holidays. I was enjoying the, the break now that fantasy is done, going on a little bit of a bender. <laughs> we earned that shit, all right? But we are bike, and we are, we're going to talk about the 2020 fantasy season, but we're going to, we're going to get in on some, some early hot takes. I think this is going to be a really, really, really fun episode. As far as content in the future going forward, I know like we kind of just dipped off uh, out of nowhere as soon as week 16 was done, but we will have a lot of content coming out throughout the next few months. Um, we have not locked down exactly what we're going to be doing, but I know Key pieces of content right now. I don't know which days of the week. I will be diving back into some of the interviews I do, the behind the scenes interviews with um, different people in the fantasy football space. So you could drop a comment down below if you have any guys in mind you'd like to see me interview. Uh, I'll list that playlist down below too if you want to go check those out. I had a lot of fun doing those. Um, those will be on it. We're going to be doing a lot of dynasty content. So Noah and someone else that we're bringing on as a second guest will be doing a, a weekly dynasty segment. I'll hop on. Um, maybe weekly, maybe bi-weekly, whenever the fuck I feel like hopping on, to be honest with you. That will be covered throughout the uh, offseason. I will do some regular redraft stuff, but I don't feel like diving into redraft right now because it's just like literally still fucking week 17. So it would be a little bit crazy to do that. Um, expect a lot more vlogs coming out. Expect a lot more kind of behind the scenes stuff. Fade the Public, as always, will continue to be a weekly podcast. So we got big things coming for the summer, man. I'm, I'm super fucking excited. And uh, right before the show, Noah... Noah uh, told me he's going he's gonna to come out to Manhattan for the summer. So he's going to be uh, crashing. We might get bunk beds, honestly, for the new HQ. <laughs> Love but, that. Yeah, but he's going to be crashing probably on the floor, sometimes in the bathtub, maybe under the kitchen table. <laughs> Should be a, a wild, wild, wild summer. And that means fantastic fucking content for y'all. Today's going to be fantastic fucking content. Hot takes for 2020 fantasy football. Hit that intro. So I'm assuming we're going to release this on Wednesday. We're filming it on Monday, which means it's January 1st, which means it, it is officially 2020. So welcome to the new year. I hope this year is the best one of your goddamn life because it's about to be the best one of ours. Let's talk comparisons. Two guys I'm going to list off to you, and I want you to tell me which of the two gets drafted higher in 2020 fantasy football drafts, redraft. Austin Eckler, Melvin Gordon. I think the only way Melvin Gordon gets picked ahead of Eckler is if both stay with the Chargers this offseason. I don't see how Melvin Gordon returns. And maybe if he goes to like a Tampa Bay or a Houston, he moves ahead of Eckler. But with what Austin Eckler showed, not only in the beginning of the season, like handling a load and being efficient with it, but just last year as well, he was like RB26 on a limited workload. He only played like three games without Gordon. I just think everything points in his direction to be you know, a top 10 fringe top five back if he's the only guy in Los Angeles. And also if Melvin Gordon doesn't end up in one of those two situations and he goes to a Miami and maybe like the Jets move on from Le'Veon Bell and think that they can squeeze some juice out of Melvin Gordon. I'm not sure I'd pick him like as a top 10 guy, just because we've seen like year after year, if you're behind a bad offensive line, if you're in a bad offense, you just can't trust even elite running backs to produce. So I think in most scenarios, like 95% of the time, I think Austin Eckler is going to be picked ahead of Melvin Gordon next season. Yeah, um, this is actually a really intriguing duo here. Um, there's All of these takes are going to be obviously fucking scorching hot because we have no idea what's going to happen throughout free agency, throughout the NFL draft. I feel like Melvin Gordon will end up elsewhere. I think Eckler will end up back in L.A. Um, and if Eckler is the guy, my, my concern is that they take a running back in like the third round or so, which I don't actually think they're going to do. Maybe a later round pick, like fifth or sixth round, which I'd be fine. In that case, Eckler would be a very, very high draft pick. I think if Melvin Gordon does end up, I think he's going to go to somewhere that's going to use him as a workhorse. And I think, I don't think a team like Miami or the Jets are really going to go after him. I do think a, a more likely landing spot would be somewhere like the Texans or the Tampa Bay Buccaneers where he will operate as a workhorse. So I actually see this being really, really close. I could see both guys being like early second round pick next year. Uh, if I had to like gun to my head right now, I would say Eckler probably winds up as the earlier pick. Yeah, and if so, you look at the Chargers on paper, though, like, they don't really have too many holes. I know a lot of players always get injured, and they have a lot of guys signed through next year. 
So maybe they do want to add a running back through the draft. But I think if they just go into the year with Eckler and Justin Jackson, you can really like rationalize him being a top 12 pick this offseason. Yeah, I mean, Eckler proved that he can handle a big workload this this year. And plus, I mean, they're never going to give one guy, you know, 25 touches a game. So kind of siphoning some to Justin Jackson makes a lot of sense. And Eckler's proven to be, be one of the most efficient running backs in the NFL. He's basically one of the guys from PFF tweeted out. He was like, a, he's basically like a Christian McCaffrey light at this point. So good in the receiving game. So good running the ball. All assets of the game. Uh, Austin Eckler is just so dynamic. So um, he's going to be good regardless of who else is in the backfield there in L.A. with him. Let's move over to a couple of young wide receivers that had their first breakout years this year. A.J. Brown, the rookie, Cortland Sutton, the sophomore wide receiver. Which of these two gets drafted earlier in 2020 drafts? At this point, like a couple of weeks ago when I was thinking about this, I thought it was Sutton, no doubt, just because he dominated with three different quarterbacks, Brandon Allen, Drew Locke, Joe Flacco, all tall white quarterbacks that Joe, John Elway absolutely loves. But now we just see A.J. Brown over these last five or it's six weeks. Man. He's he's going for like 1,600 yards. He's He looks elite in every sense of the word. I know we've said it. He's basically Julio Jones and Josh Gordon put together. Um, I know that's a little bit of a hot take, but what he's done over these past few weeks, you know, he's beating guys deep. He's beating guys after the catch. He's used in all facets of the game. He has a quarterback that can actually throw him the ball. Now that they're going into the playoffs, I think if he produces and he continues uh, this production in the playoffs, I don't see how he isn't picked like outside of the third or fourth round next season because – He's just been dominant once he's had an actual quarterback throwing him the ball. And that's not to take – Brown's going to be an early third-round pick next year in redraft. I wouldn't be surprised if he ended up creeping into, like, the late second just because of how fucking good he's been finishing this season. And I would have agreed with you. Like, Sutton had been so consistent. Um, But, I I mean, the separator – yeah, like, he's a combination. He's not as good in the air, like, targeting the ball at catch point as Julio is, but he's better after the catch, I think, than Julio is. So it's like uh, give some, take some, but I would take that as a receiver. Like, what's more important, being able to go up and just get a ball and then falling to the ground or making plays after the catch? And when you're A.J. Brown size, you know, 6'2", or whatever, 225, being able to move that well after the catch is, is such a ridiculously rare feature for, uh, for a wide receiver like A.J. Brown at that size. So I'm looking at, like, it, what he did was incredible. He was he ended up this year. I I, I was looking at uh, the final season numbers. He was wide receiver eight in standard leagues. He was a top eight fantasy wide receiver. Makes no fucking sense. He was only really getting playing time these last five or six weeks. He just blew up. He's yeah. He didn't have. He played. He ended up playing on sixty seven percent of the team snaps this year, which is way like most you know wide receiver ones are around ninety percent. They flirt with that mark. He didn't have a single game above forty snaps until week nine, and that's when he came up. And it makes me say like. What the fuck are these coaches doing? I don't, how do you have a guy like A.J. Brown sitting on the sideline and we're like, yeah, we're going to play Tajay Sharp. We're going to play Adam Humphreys because he's a rookie. He needs to learn the ropes. Like, they gave bro, him that bag like $9 million a year do? for Adam – what's his name? Adam Humphreys to like carry around his water bottle. Yeah, it makes me so fucking mad when coaches do that shit and like they end up getting credit because things went well. But Ryan Tannehill has been – like Ryan Tannehill is going to be the quarterback of the Titans next year, which makes me – infinitely more confident in a guy like A.J. Brown than it does. Because you're seeing, like, the target share. You're seeing the confidence that he has in A.J. Brown. Like, yesterday he was making ridiculous – that one – you see that one at the one-yard line? The double yeah. coverage, yeah. The fact that Tannehill even threw that up to him tells you that, like, he knows how good A.J. Brown is as a wide receiver, and that's something that's not going to waver. And I look at Cortland Sutton. It's like, yes, he's had a great year. I think he went over 1,100 yards. He's, like, quietly one of the better receivers in the entire NFL – the splits with different quarterbacks do make me a little nervous. Uh, this is with Joe Flacco over the first eight games of the season, which were when he started. Um, they're not like a crazy, crazy split, but you could see he got um, – he, he was way more efficient. He was catching a lot more balls, obviously, because they were a little bit more accurate than guys like Brandon Allen and Drew Locke throwing him the ball. I'm, I'm assuming Drew Locke is going to be the guy who's the starting quarterback for the Broncos next year. He will, of course, develop because they'll have a whole offseason to kind of go through the reps and stuff with. Um, Cortland Sutton, but at this point, you have to be way more confident that Ryan Tannehill is the quarterback for your guy than um, than uh, fucking Drew Locke. And I'm looking at other like numbers, just how good AJ Brown truly was on such a limited snap count. Five games of over 100 receiving yards. Only Michael Thomas, Julio, and Chris Godwin had more than that. He led all wide receivers in 40 plus yard touchdowns because he had, um, I think, he tied the, the lead with four receiving touchdowns of 40 plus yards. Also had the rushing touchdown of 40 plus yards. So he's extremely diverse. Uh, second in the NFL in yards after catch, 14 red zone targets this year, which was 63rd among wide receivers. So if he starts getting the targets in the red zone, starts scoring a little bit more for places that you can expect him to score, plus those yak kind of bombs that he puts up on the stat sheet, he's going to be ridiculous. He went over 1,000 yards, which is obviously a feat that most rookie wide receivers don't end up doing. 
just just so yeah, good. I actually have like a, a thing for that through like the pro football uh, reference, like splits app or whatever. AJ mm-hmm. Brown at 22 years old, there have only been 13 receivers to ever go over a thousand receiving yards in their rookie year at the age of 22 or younger. Some of the names are Randy Moss, Odell Beckham Jr., Mari Cooper, Mike Evans, Keenan Allen, uh, Chris Collinsworth, the master of the slide. Like there's so many guys on that list that blew up and were actually like wide receiver ones for multiple years thereafter. And I think A.J. Brown fits into that mold perfectly. And he reminds me a lot of two different receivers in the NFL right now. One being Juju Smith-Schuster, who in his rookie year had like 80 targets and he blew up his second year because even though he was super efficient as a rookie, as those targets went up, the efficiency dipped a little bit. But he's just such a good player that even if the efficiency dips, it offsets so much with the volume he's set to see in his second year that he became like a top five receiver. And the second guy as to why I think A.J. Brown is going to be like a third round pick next year is Chris Godwin. People were kind of hesitant to reach on Godwin this offseason because there was a lot of hype on him, but people couldn't justify kind of taking an unknown and like inside the top 36. A.J. Brown is that same big physical receiver that wins after the catch like Godwin was. And I think now that he did it, like proved that he was a top five, top three receiver in fantasy, a lot of people are going to be reaching on A.J. Brown and going to feel like a lot more confident in taking him, knowing that he could fit into that mold in 2020. Yeah, and, and going back to the receivers that broke 1,000 yards, I'm look, if you go back to 1998 when Randy Moss was the first guy to do it, 1,000 yards as a rookie, Randy Moss since then up until now, Randy Moss, Anquan Bolden, Michael Clayton, Marcus Colden, Colston, A.J. Green, Keenan Allen, Odell Beckham, Mike Evans, Kelvin Benjamin. Like that list outside of Kelvin Benjamin pretty much is, is near flawless. So it's like, you know, it's only up to go for A.J. Brown, which is incredible to say considering how good he was. So I'm also going to go with A.J. Brown. I think both of them will be – at minimum, third round picks. I think both of them could very well end up being like top eight wide receivers for fantasy next year. Let's talk about a couple other uh, young wide receivers, Terry McLaurin or Hollywood Brown. Uh, you know, just off a raw, you know, feel, you're probably going to go with Terry because he was way more consistent. He put up a lot more production. Final numbers, 93 targets, 58 receptions, 919 yards, seven touchdowns, only played in 14 games. So he would have been another wide receiver as a rookie Had he played in those two extra games, all he needed was 80 more yards. He would have got that, and he would have been one of those, you know, very, very few rookie wide receivers that went over 1,000 yards. I love this kid. I think Terry McLaurin is, like, a legit wide receiver one, um, legit NFL, like, elite athlete in terms of his metrics, and then he was able to translate that onto the field. The question, again, though, is um, quarterback in Washington. Do we – Do we trade off the fact that he will be getting targets from Dwayne Haskins who can very well develop and become, you know, uh, Ben Roethlisberger type in in Washington here if they put the weapons and put the O-line around him? Or do we kind of bank on Lamar Jackson, who is already shown to be, you know, a very elite uh, quarterback, maybe not in the passing game. I know he had a lot of passing touchdowns, but of course he's more valuable via his feet when it comes to fantasy. Hollywood Brown, 71 targets, 46 catches, 584 yards. Did have seven touchdowns and again, only 14 games. He showed us glimpses. Like he started off the year scorching fucking hot and you're like, holy shit, this kid is going to be a monster. Um, then he was kind of played with injuries throughout the year. And that goes back probably to the Liz Frank injury that he came into the year with right before the combine. That's why I didn't run, but we knew how explosive this kid was. I mean, I love both of these guys. I think that Terry will get drafted earlier, but I will – I think Hollywood will probably go a round or two after Terry, but I'm probably going to split the revenue on both these guys and probably draft, you know, one of them here, one of them here, and hopefully get a good mix of them on my teams. What do you think? Yeah, I think in a vacuum you have to take Terry just because he gives you that week after week consistency. Even with, like, incompetent quarterback play for most of the season, he still finished. I, I'm not sure exactly, but I assume a top 24 receiver, if not, like, a top 30 guy – the thing is with Hollywood Brown, like he didn't run at the combine. He didn't do much in the off season. I doubt he even played in the preseason. If I can remember correctly, like he really had no chemistry to build with Lamar Jackson because he wasn't on the field for most of the off season. Now heading into his second year already showing that they had chemistry when they were playing together, just having a full off season to build together with one of the best young quarterbacks in the NFL. Um, I think the discount you're going to get for Hollywood Brown in comparison to Terry McLaurin, probably two or three rounds later, because Hollywood Brown, I think it sticks out that people wasted, not wasted, but they spent like number one waiver priority on Hollywood early in the season. I think that might leave a bad taste in their mouth when they realize he was popping up on the injury report a lot and he was kind of boom bust. Um, I think the discount will be there for Hollywood in favor of him over uh, McLaurin. And for that discount, I think you can, um, you can factor in that he's going to be a little bit boom bust. And for that reason being cheaper, I would take him over McLaurin. 
I think I, I think you would take Hollywood over McLaurin. You're, you're talking about based on if, where they're – Yeah, be based at. on ADP, but in a vacuum, if they were both going like pick 48 and 49, I would take Terry McLaurin. Yeah, I think uh, Hollywood is, is so small, but the few plays that you watched him this year where he exploded – He was breaking tackles. It made it feel like – like this was the second coming of Terry kill. It made it feel like he could be an alpha despite his size. So it's like, I don't want to discount Hollywood Brown. Cause I think he's going to be this wide receiver class was out of control. Like this is the future of the NFL for the next, you know, 10 years or whatever. The guys that came out in this class, uh, can we talk about for a second too? like Lamar Jackson, the fact that he did all of this, if this, if, if any other quarterback had this fucking receiving group, it would be like, you wouldn't you would be like oh you know that's the excuse why he didn't do well for this year it was like you know willie sneed was like his top target for a lot of games it makes no sense you chris know? moore was like catching valuable third down passes like who wants like chris moore like andrews was banged up a lot this year hollywood brown was banged up a lot this year lamar jackson was throwing to literally nobody it made no sense how good he was this year it was crazy 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 yeah and i know they have a lot of players to pay on defense this offseason but if they just add another receiver or two through the draft i don't see how lamar jackson we'll get it to it later but i don't see how he can't be like the quarterback one for the next three or four years yeah absolutely and i think you know fuck uh, fuck the defense bro just let him put up madden numbers on offense (laughs) let them give up 40 points and let them do some cheap shit to be a 2018 rookie running backs i'm talking a lot about these rookie wide receivers but beginning of the year you know, Miles Sanders wasn't doing shit. He was he was relegated behind Jordan Howard for the most part, splitting touches. Josh Jacobs was the guy in Oakland. I don't think a lot of people realize this, but Miles Sanders ended up finishing with more yards from scrimmage than Josh Jacobs did because he exploded down the stretch. Um, Miles Sanders was a guy that I had higher in my rookie rankings coming into the year than Josh Jacobs. My concerns for Josh Jacobs were that we've never seen him operate as a workhorse, and I don't know if he could stand up to the NFL um, – you know, caliber of defense that would be put onto his body and, and just starting taking those kind of hits. And, uh, you know, he didn't get injured until like semi recent, I guess he was kind of injured throughout the year in the middle of the year, at least, but he didn't get seriously injured until recently. And, uh, and now he, you know, missed the remainder of the season. So going into next year, um, I just want to know real quick, who do you think gets drafted higher? I, th- I think there's a clear answer here. I think Miles Sanders does just because of his pass catching ability, even early. in. I don't think so. You don't think think so? I think if we fast forward to September 1st next year and we're doing a draft, I think Josh Jacobs will. People are going to remember what he did for the beginning of this year. People are just going to be like, Josh Jacobs is like a top five running back and that's it. Like, I don't think people really dive into the numbers and and look at things in context that well. Um, Will I draft Miles Sanders over Josh Jacobs? I don't know because I, I still, I, I still have that like, kind of nervous feeling like Boston Scott it literally looks like fucking Boston Sproles out there. I wouldn't be surprised if that's the role that he took going into next year. Miles Sanders will be involved every aspect of the game, but you know, do they bring Jordan Howard back in to be a thumper again? Do they bring another running back in because they like to use our running back by committee? I think there are, I think there are still red flags when it comes to Miles Sanders, not from a talent perspective or what he can do on the NFL field because the guy's a beast and he's explosive, but just the Eagles running back situation is a tough one to really buy into over the long term like we've seen him be great over the last month or so how well does that translate so I just think people look at Josh Jacobs they're like oh my god what a great rookie like he's the future at the running back position even though he didn't catch passes even though he did end up getting hurt I think Josh Jacobs will end up like wouldn't surprise me if he if he crept into the top 15 even like top 12 picks next year people will convince themselves into it I think yeah, what worries me about Miles Sanders, if you think about it, right, those first like seven, eight weeks of the season, he really wasn't doing anything other than a few like big receiving plays. It mm-hmm. took Jordan Howard, Deshaun Jackson, Alshon Jeffrey, Nelson Aguilar. It took everybody on that team getting hurt for him to put up what he's doing now. And I'm not going to like take that away from him because he's been like a top five running back over the past month and a half. But I mean, next year, you're right. If Jordan Howard comes back, we've already seen Doug Peterson. And you've mentioned it before, like coaching matters. If Doug Peterson's still around, which he will be because they made the playoffs, and Jordan Howard comes back, I don't see how they just move to Miles Sanders being a full three down back, playing 75% of the snaps, which is almost what he needs to return value of like a top 15 running back. Yeah, it's, it, people are just going to have to convince themselves that they believe Sanders is getting 75% of the touches there. And, you know, if all signs point to that towards the offseason, I could buy in a little more. I'm just not sure I, I will buy in. But, again, this is not who we rank higher. We, this is just hot takes on who we think will get drafted higher in 2020 draft. Let's run through the next three, like, very quickly, not even really analysis because this is already taking very long. We have a lot more left on the show sheet. So, who gets drafted first in 2020 drafts, Mike Evans or Chris Godwin? Chris Godwin. I will probably agree with you there. Cooper Cup or Robert Woods? 
Cooper Cup. Also agree with you there. Lamar Jackson or Julio Jones? This is super close. I think One quarterback leagues too. Even then, I think Lamar sneaks into that first round just because of what he does with his legs. Yeah. Um, this is this is going to be a great debate all offseason. I, I, I'm excited to see, like, how people – what sides people take in terms – because obviously Lamar Jackson is super flex league, easy top three pick, no discussion about it. But when it comes to one quarterback leagues, you know, the, the notion is always late quarterback, late quarterback, because the points per game difference is never that high. However, Lamar Jackson finished almost seven points. It was It was – 6.4 points per game more than the next closest quarterback. Uh, Christian McCaffrey, on the other hand, finished with 6.7 fantasy points per game more than the next closest running back. So Lamar Jackson actually gave you the most advantageous – or gave, gave you a similar advantage week over week at quarterback than, like, Christian McCaffrey did at running back. The difference, however, where people need to put into context is that when you're drafting next year, what you need to remember is that – while the next closest quarterback was six and a half points away from Lamar, you're also getting them eight rounds later. Whereas the next running back is six and a half points away from C-Mac. You can't even get them eight picks later. You know what I mean? So it's like you have to take that into account where you're giving up a lot of draft capital in order to get that advantage when you can get a guy like each year, there's going to be the guys like the Dax and the Winstons and those guys you can get in rounds nine or 10 where you're giving up for Lamar Jackson round one. Will I fault people for doing it? Absolutely not. Because I think whereas you look at a guy like Patrick Mahomes and people were nervous about regression this year and, you know, rightfully so because he had so much efficiency in the passing game. Lamar Jackson, the way he gets his fantasy production from the running style is not going to stop anytime soon. They built that offense around him being able to operate that way. So I think he is as safe as anyone to repeat those quarterback one numbers. And when we get into a few of the questions down below, um, I, it'll be an interesting debate to, to have whether or not we could see anyone dethroning Lamar Jackson. So uh, final verdict, I, I think it'll be super split. If we go with end of summer ADP, I actually think Lamar Jackson will probably go above Julio. Yeah, I think just the hype he had and the fact that, as you brought up, like he can do it with his arm. I think he led the league in passing touchdowns and he ran for over a thousand yards. Like he can do it however you want it. And the way that he's better at doing it with his legs is more valuable for fantasy. So yeah, I just, I don't see how he falls outside the top 12 with how good of a season he had and just how much improvement he showed from his rookie year to his sophomore season. Because we saw in the playoffs, like the Chargers shut him down. They knew how to like scheme around him. This year, nobody figured that out. No, it's going to be ridiculous. Um, speaking of Julio, let's talk about some veteran wide receivers um, and whether or not we think they are going to fall off the cliff. A few of them were kind of iffy this year. They started dealing with injuries. And most of the time when the older, the older wide receivers start to get more and more plagued with injuries, it's a sign of their decline. But we have Julio, Thielen, Hilton, Julian Edelman, all guys that are kind of getting up there in age or already up there in age. Um, Thielen, Hilton, Edelman all dealt with injuries this year. Edelman toughed it out for the most part. Hilton's been dealing with these lower leg injuries now for, you know, a few years. This is really the first time Thielen's been banged up. Um, and we have Julio there. So of these – of these guys, like, who do you think is the safest and who do you think is most likely to fall off? Julio, Thielen, Hilton, Edelman. I think the safest, it's really close for me between Julio and Thielen. Just because Thielen's a bit older, but he doesn't have that, like, wear and tear on his body that a lot of other of these older guys have because he only broke out two or three years ago. And at that point, he was older, but he didn't really have those full seasons of getting hit over the middle like Julian Edelman did, like T.Y. Hilton has shown to do, and Julio Jones. Like, I think that next year with Kirk Cousins showing that when Adam Thielen's on the field, he's his unquestioned number one. The yeah. volume's going to be there. And if he stays healthy, which, I mean, he had a hamstring injury this season. I don't think that's just going to be a recurring thing year after year. Um, I think he could easily finish as a top 12 guy. Julio Jones, a lot of those, like, big athletic receivers kind of fall off quickly once they hit 30, 31. But Julio's just such a good receiver. Like, like a Larry Fitzgerald, he's fairly athletic, but he's been a wide receiver one up until he was, like, 33, 34. I don't think it's much different for Julio just in the fact that he's very good and he doesn't solely rely on his athleticism. Um, as for who I'm nervous about. Do you think the gap starts to close between Julio and Calvin Ridley or you just think they're still on different planets when it comes to like being NFL receivers? I just, I think Julio is just like so much better than most receivers in the league and Calvin Ridley's going to take a step forward, but I still think he's the unquestioned number one there. And I think that they showed this year they can both eat like at the same time. Yeah, I agree. I mean, Calvin missed the last three games and he would have ended up being uh, he would have ended up going over a thousand yards again had he not missed the last three games, most likely. So we had another good season, not really like the breakout. I think a lot of people were expecting, but 
Yeah, I don't know. I, I, maybe not like a full fall off, but I don't know if I want to be drafting Julio in the first round again this year. Like, I could see him going from – he's going to finish with around 1,400 yards. I could see him going from like 1,400 maybe down to like 1,250 and seven touchdowns or something like that, which is not necessarily – touchdowns. Um, That's a little optimistic. Uh, I mean, he's got six this year. He went eight the year before that. So I think he's right in the middle of that. Uh, I, I think that, like, that's not something I want to invest my first round draft capital into. If I can get him in a second, that's great. I, I like the call with Thielen, too. I'm I'm pretty on board with the bounce back from Thielen. I don't think anything he's shown this year has uh, inclinated, like, anything with aging. Like, I think he's fine. So he doesn't have a lot of tread on his tires in the NFL anyway, so I'm not worried about his body being banged up. Edelman's been banged up all year. Plus, you're kind of looking at just the Patriots offense going down the absolute shit. Or we'll have to see what kind of changes they make this offseason. Um, we'll see what they do in the, in the postseason if they're able to really adjust and turn the dial back on that offense. We'll see. But Edelman scares me a lot. Hilton, I actually kind of like Hilton next year, too, if we can get him at a discount. Because in the games that he played, like fully healthy with Brissett, he was easily the number one target. He was playing well. They have all of their weapons pretty much going into free agency this year. So we'll see what they add through the draft. We'll see what they add in, in free agency. Uh, but Hilton, I, I don't hate at all. He's not a guy I'm going to be like leaning on to, you know, bounce back and be a top 15 guy. But if you can get him as as your wide receiver three or something, I think that's that's fantastic value. But um, but Thielen's probably my favorite guy value wise next year because I think you'll probably be able to get him in like the fourth round because people are kind of going to be off of him. Um, I think now. next year we'll see the same thing where it's like, who would you take, Adam Thielen or Stephon Diggs? And every time we see that the two are on the field together healthy, it's always Adam Thielen. But every year it's always yep. Stephon Diggs ADP wise. So. Yeah, I just take Thielen at the discount. Yeah, you ever get nervous? I forget what receiver I was thinking about. Like, you, you know, we get, like, hyped up about young wide receivers that are – that, like, we want to buy into and we're like, oh, their ceiling is so high. But, like, Stephon Diggs, his his dynasty value has been so high for so long. But, like, I get nervous that some guys will just be at that, like, 1,000, 1,100-yard mark, like, year over year over year and never take that next step up and it feels no, like this for me be there until someone like in vet, until he like really claims the wide receiver one role somewhere it feels like he's just kind of stuck in in wide receiver two purgatory yeah the same guy for me I'm not sure if it's the guy you're thinking about but it's Amari Cooper for me and I put out a tweet the other day it's at this point in Amari Cooper's career he has posted less than 50 receiving yards in 38 of 76 games 50 percent of the time he's went under 50 receiving yards in Dallas it's been 11 out of 24 times, 46% of the time. So even though he's in Dallas in a seemingly better situation, he's still that same boom bust guy that always seems to like drop big passes. And I know this year he started off extremely hot, but I mean, can you really trust him week after week to be that top 12 player? And I know the upside is there. And now there's talk of him leaving because they want to use, who was it, Tavon Austin over him because he's a smaller, quicker receiver. Like, I actually, I actually like Amari Cooper, and that wasn't the guy I was thinking of. The guy I was thinking of uh, was DJ Moore. DJ Moore is a guy, right? He he had such a big uh, such a big breakout this year in his second year, but he reminds me a lot of Stephon Diggs, man. Where we're really hyped up about him, and like you might even rank him inside your top three or five dynasty wide receivers right now. But it's it's hard to imagine a scenario when they have C Mac as the number one guy, when they do have Curtis Samuel there, and they don't have a reliable downfield accurate quarterback. Like do DJ Moore is going to finish this year with like 1,100, 1,200 receiving yards. Do we ever see him take that step up? Or maybe not ever, but like over the next two to three years, do we see him take that step up into the upper echelon of 1,400, 1,500, 1,600 receiving yards? I don't know. Like, I don't know. I, I, I'm going to have to talk myself into buying buying into DJ Moore where his draft capital is going to be next year. I think the difference between he and Stephon Diggs is I think Diggs is a little bit more dependent on QB play because he is used down the field a little bit more. DJ Moore is usually used in like the short and intermediate game, and he makes a lot of his yards after the catch. And yeah. I think he showed that this year with Kyle Allen. So, but then again, like, can you trust a guy to get like 1100 of his 1400 yards after the catch because of poor quarterback play? So I well, guess that's what I mean, yeah, I mean, he's going to end up with about around 140 targets. Like, I don't think there's that much more room for like a higher ceiling. So if you're not getting downfield targets or you're not going to get accurate ones, I don't, I don't know how much higher the ceiling gets. I mean, obviously he could, he could take a step forward next year, but um, I, I might be looking at him as more of a floor play than a ceiling play. Um, I, I don't, I don't really know, but yeah, I agree uh, with what you said. More of a floor play. He's not really scoring a ton of touchdowns, and I think he's a safer bet than Diggs. But I don't think he has the upside just because Diggs is Diggs is phenomenal, phenomenal when he gets the ball. DJ Moore kind of has to do everything on his own to be as good as you want him to be. Yeah, it's so on the flip side. We got a couple other wide receivers that did the opposite of breakout. Very disappointing years. We have Juju and OBJ, uh, both picked in that 
Julio Jones, Michael Thomas area of drafts last year, like top 10 to 15 picks pretty much. Both of them miserable this year. Juju, a whole nother level of miserable. He finished as the wide receiver 68 in points per game. Overall, he was probably like wide receiver 90 or some shit. It was just a terrible year. OBJ finished as wide receiver 25 overall, but around wide receiver 35 in fantasy points per game. So both of them were absolutely um, terrible for their respective teams. Juju, I felt like was a whole nother level of terrible though, because he dealt with not only Ben going down early on, which was terrible and kind of ruined the season for him, but he was just not good when he was on the field either. I don't know if it was the injuries. I don't know really what it was, but you had these other guys like Deontay Johnson and James Washington have plenty of blow up games while Juju was not getting it done um, with the backup quarterback. So next year, who is more likely, if either of them, to finish as an elite fantasy wide receiver? 2020, either of them get into the top five. And if not, who's most likely to do it? I don't think either make it into that top five, but I think who's more likely would be Odell Beckham Jr. Just because we've seen what he can do with competent quarterback play. And it was his first year in this new offense with a coach who just got fired, which I think is a good thing for this offense because they bring in Ted Munkin and they don't use him at all. Todd, Todd, Todd Munkin. Toddy Munkin. My bad. See, they oh, used him so little, I don't even know his name. So exactly. He was like dominating in Tampa Bay, just in that air raid type of offense down there. They go up to Cle- – he comes up to Cleveland – and they're throwing, like, two-yard slants and just throwing, like, 50-yard bombs 100 yards over Odell's head. I think next year if they try to switch up things in the front office or in the coaching um, coaching room, and Odell is still there this offseason, I don't know. I just think that his upside, even with Baker showing that he's not really an elite quarterback this season, I think his upside is so much higher than Juju's because, as you said, Deontay Johnson really cemented himself this year as a very good, talented young receiver. Um, James Washington even showed some flashes in the deep game, and I know big – Ben Roethlisberger didn't really have those two um, all too much to throw to, whether it was last year because Deontay wasn't in the league and James Washington was barely using this season. Um, he got hurt before those two broke out. So Juju's still going to be his number one option. But I don't know. I just think Odell has a much higher ceiling. Juju might have the floor with targets. But even then, Odell, what do you see this year? Like 120-plus targets. So I, I don't know. I think he has the higher upside. And Juju is just – he might fall into that third round this season. I'm not sure I'm willing to pull the trigger at that price. Yeah, he'll probably be an early third rounder. I think both of them will probably be around early third round. I don't know if I want to take either of them, to be honest with you. It's just been like too many disappointing years in a row for OBJ. Everyone just keeps hanging on that like per game numbers, but it's like at one point you got to put it all together, you know? And yeah, I just hated what we saw from Juju this year. So I'm probably out on both of them. If I had to kind of just throw it out there and say who is more likely Honestly, I might take Juju over OBJ. Like, I don't really want any part of that Cleveland situation right now. Um, so if Big if Big Ben is back, I, I might take Juju over OBJ right now. All right. Who plays more NFL games in the year 2020? Antonio Brown, Andrew Luck, Josh Gordon, Will Fuller, A.J. Green, or you and me? Honestly, I'll take a bus. It's got to be us. I think we have the best odds, and I put my money on that. Like, I'm eligible this year. I might I might run at the combine. I don't know. We're uh, putting up at least 30 games between the two of us. <laughs> I'm going 16. You're definitely going to miss at least two games with a fucking shin splints or some shit. <laughs> You're too tall. Yeah. I'll be like David Sills or whatever from last year. But, um, yeah, honestly, of these guys that you listed other than us, I would say Will Fuller, but I have no faith in him. I'm probably just going Antonio Brown because – he might be on the commissioner's exempt list, but I would take a risk on that instead of betting on Will Fuller's hamstring any day of the week. Yeah. Um, I I think A.J. Green and Antonio Brown will realistically be NFL starting wide receivers in 2020. Will Fuller will too, but I don't trust him to fucking play more than eight games. So I would actually say A.B. I think A.B. probably plays the most games in, in 2020 out of this list. All right. Section, big facts or big farce? Quick hits. I'm going to read you off a statement. You're going to tell me whether it's big facts or if it's big farce. Josh Jacobs catches over 39 and a half passes in 2020. Facts. That's not correct. That's not the correct terminology. The big section fact. is called big facts big or fact. big That's farce. That's a huge fact. Okay. So you go big facts over 39 and a half. Devontae Parker will be a consensus fourth round or better pick in 2020 drafts. Big farce. 
Yeah, you think he falls out of the fourth? Yeah, I think I those like, years of him just like disappointing kind of stays in people's brain, and he's going to fall into like the fifth or sixth. I think there's going to be too much mix up in Miami this offseason, too, for him to just stay put. If it was the exact same situation, like Preston Williams was still out, Ryan Fitzpatrick still the quarterback, I could buy into it, but there's no way that they don't make too many moves there in, in, uh, in 2020. All right. Someone not named Christian McCaffrey will finish next year as the RB1. Big facts. You think someone else? I think so. I mean, there was always that stat of, like, nobody ever doing it back-to-back until Todd Gurley did it, like, the previous two years to this year. Um, And I just think with Saquon Barkley, a full healthy season, you can't write him off. And even – I know this might sound crazy, but Joe Mixon, what he's done these past few weeks with a terrible offensive line and a terrible team altogether, if they get Joe Burrow in there, who is thrown to his running back, Clyde Edwards-Hilaire, a ton, and they still have Zach Taylor there, who brought – like, he was part of that McVay system. Gurley went from, like, 34 catches to 64 in one season – I think if they use him in the passing game and he just continues to run as well as he is right now, which I have no doubt he can because he's an elite player, I don't think you can write him off as being – never going to fucking use him in the passing game, bro. It's so frustrating. He would be yeah. so damn good. I think that, yeah, the Bengals are going to be fucking – they're going to be fired next year with Burroughs coming in and um, the left tackle that they drafted in the first round this year. Did you watch the, the interview between Belichick and Nick Saban on HBO? No, I did not. They have a meeting like every off season or whatever, and they let HBO film it this time. And they talked about it. And like Nick Saban was talking about how so many players from Alabama get drafted, but a lot of the teams and a lot of the coaches that draft these players never reach out to Nick Saban and ask like how they are as players. And a lot of the times they'll draft an Alabama player and Nick Saban will be like, why the fuck would you draft that guy over this guy? So when Bill Belichick comes to the practices, he was like, uh, two years ago, before the Bengals drafted this guy, like right before the draft, he was like, "Who's the best player on your team?" And he, like, who's who was the uh, what, Jonah what was Williams? Name? What's that? Jonah Williams? Yeah, Jonah name? Williams. Um, he was like, "Who's the best player on your team?" He was like, "Jonah Williams, no doubt." And uh, and that gave me so much confidence that Nick Saban just said that outright. And he was like, "Oh, where where can you put him on the line?" And Nick Saban was like, "You could put him anywhere on the line. Like he's the best. He's you know he's the best player on our team." So that makes me feel like this Bengals line is going to be shored up like. Yeah, much, remember much how good though. this offense was when they had Whitworth there. Once they lost Whitworth, they just went to a complete, like, dumpster fire. If they get Jonah Williams to play left tackle and he's good there, like, this offense can be reminiscent of when they, like, had Jeremy Hill and A.J. Green dominating. Just have that be, well, if A.J. Green's back, but, like, Tyler Boyd and uh, Joe Mixon this season with Joe Burrow, like, an actual competent quarterback throwing them the ball. Okay, someone not named Lamar Jackson will finish 2020 as the QB1. Big farce. Facts. Someone not named Michael Thomas will finish 2020 as the wide receiver one. This is close. I'm going to say big facts because I think Tyreek Hill could work his way into that conversation. I love Tyreek Hill next year too. He'll probably be my wide receiver too. But I think I think when it's anything close in discussion, you might as well take the field. It's probably <laughs> safer. But when it's a guy like Lamar Jackson, it's just like, I don't know who the fuck is going to stop him really. All right. Some other quick hitters. And we're, we're talking about quarterbacks. Who is going to be – I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name a team, and you're going to name me who the starting quarterback for that team will be in week one of the 2020 NFL season. All right? I'm ready. Team one, Jaguars. I think it's still Nick Foles. I think it's Nick Foles, too. Team two, Chargers. Miami moved ahead of them in the draft. I was going to say Tua. I know he's not going to play next year. I think they could get Tua. I think Tyrod Taylor might have that job unless they pick up somebody in free agency. I don't see them so paying. Week though. one of the 2020 NFL season. The Chargers starting quarterback is going to be Tyrod Taylor. I love that. It's not what you love. It's <laughs> what's your take? <laughs> I, I, I honestly don't know. It, fine, I'll say Phil because that team's just going to pay him. They're so stupid. I don't even know. <laughs> starting quarterback for the Bengals in week Joe one. Of next year. Uh, the Raiders. Marcus Mariota. Love that. I was going to say James Winston, but he got fine. <laughs> uh, of the Panthers. Cam Newton. Same. All right. Uh, for this next session, we're going to do the same thing with running backs, but you don't have to pick a rookie uh, running back. If, if you think it's going to be a rookie, just say rookie. Otherwise, use an NFL player's name. Starting running back for the Chargers in week one of the 2020 NFL season will be? Austin Eckler. Of the Titans. Derrick Henry. I hate saying that name. Yeah. The Chiefs. Chuba Hubbard. Chuba Hubbard. Is he even eligible this year? I think he is. He's a red shirt. I think I'm not sure if he's declared yet, but I'd love him there. Okay. Um, you could just say rookie instead of name, but if you have a name, I was going to say DeAndre Swift. Uh, the Texans. Hmm. I I don't really know too many free agents. It's, I would say rookie probably. Okay. Uh, the Jets. 
They have Probably to rookie. Bell. I feel like they can't do another year with Bell. It's either Gase or Bell. Like, one of them fuckers has to go. I think it's going to be Bell, and I don't know if they have – they're going to spend that capital on a rookie, but I'll probably just say rookie. All right. Uh, Bucks. I think it's going to be a rookie. Jonathan Taylor. I think it's going to be Ronald Jones. I think I think Jones might earn that starting spot. Forgot uh, about him. Cardinals. Kenyon Drake. Got to be. They got to re-sign him. They got to – They got to. He's been elite him. since he's taken over that starting job. And what's in it? Cliff Kingsbury has shown that they want to use him, even though they're paying David Johnson all that money. I know it's going to be this off season. Someone tweeted out like a list of the NFL, the current like contracts in the NFL, like the highest paid running backs. And it's, it's fucking brutal. The guys that are on top, it's like Todd Gurley, Devonta Freeman, um, David Johnson. It's like all just horrible. All those teams made the playoffs too. That's probably because of the running backs, bro. Such, <laughs> such good money invested. All right. That's uh that's going to wrap up today's episode. Let me know if you guys like this kind of style of video. We could do this throughout the off season and just come up with a bunch of fucking ridiculous questions and just bounce back and forth off this. I kind of like the style. I think it went um, well, and it's a lot of interesting topics that kind of arise throughout. But that's all we got for you all today. Um, stay tuned, again, for the content throughout the off season. Let me know down in the comments below what kind of stuff you'd like to see from us, um, whether it has to do with fantasy, redraft, dynasty, uh, more behind-the-scenes stuff, faith the public, like whatever the fuck you want to see. Let us know. Make sure you're following us on Twitter to stay up to date on what we got going on behind the scenes. Uh, smash that thumbs up button if you enjoyed. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. And we will see y'all on Friday for this week's Fade the Public, which is the Fantasy Sports Award Show. We're actually, I'm going back and we're going to be filming a whole bunch of nonsense for that tomorrow. It's going to be a really fun episode. All right. Well, thank y'all for joining us. It's